the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. On occasion, I have taken what I consider to be a a long trip, driving wherever I'm going. Now, what you and I consider long trips may be different. For me, a day-long or a two-day-long trip of driving somewhere, that's long enough for me. That's what I mean by a long trip. Some of you who are here during the season, you may actually drive farther than that just to get here, longer than that just to get here. I I understand that. It's, It's all relative to our experience and our tolerance of being able to to make that trek, however we may do that. But I have to tell you, I suspect that you and I would be in agreement that the trek that the folks in today's reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, that was a long trip. That was quite a trek. If you're not familiar with with what is being told here, it's toward the end of the, the story of the Israelites fleeing Egypt. And since it's toward the end of that story, they've probably been on the road now maybe 39 years. That is a long trip. I don't have the tolerance in any way to do a 39 or 40 year trip. Now, it has not been without adventure at all. There have been all kinds of things happening. I mean, first was this, all the stuff that happened uh, in Egypt that let them get free and the Pharaoh to let them go. And then they had to cross the Red Sea, and you know how that happened. What, what, What exciting things were happening at the beginning of that trip. And as they went along, as happens with religious folks sometimes. 
there was fussing and fuming. And there was such fussing and fuming that at one point God said to Moses, come up here, get up on this mountain. And he went up there and, and he gave him the Ten Commandments. And then he said, go back down and get them in shape. And it wasn't just that time. He had to call him back up there multiple times because they would, they would get all upset about various things. First, you know, there was, there was this thing of food. There's, there's, we have no food, Moses. So Moses goes trotting back up the, the mountain, and he goes up there, and, and God says, okay, I'll send them, send them some stuff. So when they got up the next morning, there was this, this stuff on the ground around them, and they called it manna. And, oh, they, they were so happy until... They were so happy until they didn't like it anymore. I mean, they tried cooking it. They tried blending it in a shake. They tried doing all sorts of things with the manna. And finally, they just got tired of it, and they got mad at Moses again. And so Moses goes trotting back up the mountain. And God says, okay, I'll send them some meat. So he sends them quail. Oh, they were so happy. And then it was, well, that gets old, you know. Can't we get some ribs or some chicken or something else that, that we would like to have? We need some variety. They just never seemed, never seemed to get what they wanted. They never seemed to be satisfied. So they, they wind up wandering around the wilderness all this time. But you know, they're not just wandering around. There are multiple times that both Moses and God try to lead them into the promised land. And you know what happened? We're not going to go over there. I mean, they even sent spies over to make sure it was safe. And the spies came back and said, we can get in there. It'll be fine. They said, oh, no, we're not going to do that. And that happened multiple times because they were afraid. And then finally, we get to today's reading from Numbers. And lo and behold, they're dissatisfied again. Fancy that. It never happens in a church or a synagogue or anywhere else. Everybody's always happy. But this time, not only do they get mad at Moses, they blame God. Now, God's got tolerance beyond any that I could ever have, but God had had enough. So God sent vipers, poisonous snakes. In my thinking, God could have sent anything but snakes. But God sent snakes. And they began to bite and kill the Israelites. Not a good thing. And so they go to Moses and, you know, we've got to do something here. And Moses goes to God. Now, God could have done a lot of things, but what God said for them to do was to, to make a bronze image of this snake and put it on a pole and hold it up. And anyone who is bitten and looks upon this image when it's held up, will live. Will live. Now that may seem to be something of a fanciful sort of story, but it's a story that Jesus brings into the gospel today. He's, he's in this discussion with Nicodemus who's, who's shown up because he's curious about what's happening. 
with this man, Jesus. He shows up at night probably because he doesn't want his other learned folks to know that he's actually checking this guy out. And then Jesus gets to this point where he, he says to Nicodemus, just like the Israelites raised up this image of the serpent in the desert, the Son of Man will be raised up to be looked upon. And you and I know what that means, don't we? We, we? we have hindsight. We're looking back. We know He's talking about the cross being raised up. Quite an image, huh? Quite a, quite a story emerging of two stories. Yet I find within these two stories some some curious kinds of thoughts as we look upon what they may, they may mean for us. You see, I think they're relevant to us because I, I think that you and I find ourselves often like, like these people, these Israelites who go along. We, we're satisfied for a time with our faith in God. We're satisfied with how things are going, but then something happens. Maybe we get bored, or maybe someone really gets us upset, or something else happens, or maybe that fire just kind of goes out of our lives around our faith. Something happens, and we get dissatisfied, and, and, and we start to look around, and, and we blame others. I know it's far-fetched, but, but we do. I do. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this text from John. Because in this text from John, he keeps using this one word. And I think it's a word that really challenges us in, in this reading. And, and this word is believe. And I don't think that, that what he's talking about there is what you and I talk about when we talk about believe. We talk about, do you think in a certain way? But I think it's, it's a different way of approaching it. And I think that the better word for us to use and to, and to substitute throughout this text is trust. I think that there are two things with those two things being lifted up that, that I think are important for us to talk about. You see, I think when, when they raised up that serpent from the wilderness, I think it's, it supplied two functions. The first was that it was a mirror. It was a mirror. It allowed the Israelites to see what they had been doing wrong that brought about this situation. It allowed them to reflect on that and to, to know why they were, were where they were. And I think that for you and me, the cross has that function too. The cross is a mirror. I mean, we can... We can we can have some really pretty crosses, you know. We can, we can make them out of gold or bronze. We can make them out of silver. We can, we can put all kinds of nice designs on them. But at the very basic thing, it's still a cross, a horrendous image of a device of torture and capital punishment that was unique to the Romans. They used it not for the, over their own people when they did wrong. They used it over the people that they had captured, those areas where they had taken them under them. They used it, and its most important function was not that it controlled criminals, but that it controlled everyone else. But when we raise up this image, however pretty it is of, of the cross, we're allowed in that cross, it, to, in that mirror, to see ourselves, to see our own 
inability to fully and wholly trust God. And that, I believe, is the source of our dissatisfaction. Not boredom, not anything else, but our deep inability to trust God. I think we all have trust issues. I think we live it out in our daily lives with each other. We're not sure who to trust, and even those we trust, we kind of are going to hold back a little bit. But how much do you trust God? Think, think about changing those words in the scriptures we read in the gospel today. And, and especially that one, that you know, the one verse that's in this that everybody seems to know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Change that to trust. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever trusts in him, will have eternal life. It changes it. It changes it. It broadens it to the world and it also makes it a much deeper challenge for you and me because, oh, I can believe anything whether I do or not. I can assent to whatever it is you propose, but, but not necessarily that. But I think the cross and the serpent too, but I think the cross as we raise it up does something else for us too. It points us in the direction of hope. It points us in the direction of hope. Because one of the messages of the cross as it comes up with Jesus there is, hey, is this enough to show you that I love you? He could have taken away the snakes. He didn't take away the snakes. Rather, he said to them, Is this enough to show you that I love you and I will protect you? And I think that's the same message for us. That in the midst of all of this, the cross for us as it's raised up, as the Son of Man is raised up in front of us, cries out to us nothing other than, I love you. With God's finger pointed at every one of us. Trust. Do you trust each other? But do you trust God? Here's where I'm going with this. There's no great learning. There's no great theological depth, I think, in this, in this particular scripture. I think that it is the naked truth of what God offers to us. And God offers it both as a statement and a question. I love you. Do you trust me? Amen.